So we're going to be talking about investment decision rules. What's the goal of financial management? Maximize shareholder wealth. And uh, so we're supposed to pick projects that maximize shareholder wealth. But in order to do that, we need to have some decision rules, some things that we can use to judge whether we're doing that or not. I think that finance is more interesting than accounting, simply because we're making decisions about the future. And this is what I tell the, the students at Majors Fair or at Showcase. It's like uh, accounting is boring because you're recording stuff that happened in the past according to a bunch of random rules developed by a bunch of old white guys. That's really it, right? And if you look at finance, you're talking about exciting, sexy stuff, about making decisions about the future based on immutable laws of mathematics in place since the beginning of time. So, you know, to me that's a whole lot sexier, a whole lot more exciting. So, we're going to need these rules though, and we're going to find that some of these rules are better than others. And you're going to say, well, wait a minute, if this rule isn't the best rule, why do we even care about it? And that's part of what else I'm going to be telling you is why sometimes we care about these things even though they're not perfect. So we're going to ask three questions about every investment rule that we look at. Number one, does it account for the time value of money? We know that a dollar today is worth more than a dollar a year from now. Everybody knows that or should, so we need to account for it. Secondly, it accounts for the riskiness of the cash flows. Remember, the higher the risk, the higher the reward has to be. And finally, it should provide information regarding the wealth created by the project because after all, the goal of financial management is to maximize shareholder wealth. And if we don't know whether we're creating or destroying wealth, then we're not really being able to know whether we're carrying out the goal. So we're going to ask these three questions about all of these rules and we're going to give them a star rating from one, uh, zero to three. Zero to three. We're not going five stars like Amazon. We don't have two more questions. It's just three questions. And so the perfect rule is going to have three stars. And let's start off with net present value. And hopefully you guys have been already beaten silly about net present value in 380 and 390. If you don't know what net present value is, I am sorry to say that we have failed you miserably. Now, there are two ways to think about it. Uh, we can say that it's the sum of the cash flows subsequent to initial investment minus initial investment. What does subsequent to mean? After. That's all it means. Or the way that I like to do it is to say that it's the sum of all the present values of the a project at time zero. It's just present value at time zero. And we're going to sum cash flows in are positive, cash flows out are negative. And this lets us handle situations where we have more than one year of investment. For example, this morning I was reading that General Motors has put off the, the startup of their production on their electric pickup truck line in Orion, Michigan by one year. What does that mean? It means that they're going to be spreading that investment not over one year but over two years. So you're going to have cash flows, negative cash flows in two years and then it'll turn positive. So I like my definition a little better. So what's the rule? The rule is always accept positive NPV projects, all positive NPV projects. And we'll talk about when that's not possible. For purposes of homework, practice, and exams, this is perfectly the rule to use. But when we get into reality, we've got to be a little careful with this. What if I have a project that has an NPV of $5 positive? Would I accept or reject? In the, in, according to the rule, we're going to accept it, right? What if I, and if I told you that the initial investment was 50 bucks, does that sound real like a, an okay idea? We're going to invest 50 bucks and we're going to make five. Yeah, that sounds great. What if I told you the initial investment was a billion? That's a bad idea, right? Then you'd have a billion and five. And I'm getting ready to tell you why, in reality, it's a bad idea. Okay, here we go. I'm, and this is a true example from my own career. I had a new machine that I was going to put in. $700,000 machine. And we had done the NPV analysis 
And the NPV of this thing was around $25,000, positive $25,000. Mr. Dexheimer, should I accept the project? Yeah, yeah, we should, you know, by the rule, right? Okay, so, uh, and my boss says, are you sure? And I'm like, yeah, and we've been through everything and we've, you know, we've really, we think we've got our crap together. Now, one of the things that the machine, by the way, you've got big machines making very precise things, they have to be well anchored into the floor, right? So they don't shake because you'd have chatter and all that other sorts of stuff. And so uh, we had uh, thoroughly investigated, said we needed 12 inches of concrete to anchor this machine into. And so we rolled out the plans from the building. Uh, 1964, it had been just a cotton field, and then they put this uh, oil field tools factory on it. And uh, the plan said there were 14 inches of concrete there. 14 inches is greater than 12. We're good to go, right? The day comes, the machine's there, sitting right there. I could see the thing. And the millwright, that's a person that installs machines, the millwright comes in. And he says, okay, I'm gonna, gonna install the anchors. And he's got this big drill. And he does like this, he's going Bzzz. And then all of a sudden, whoosh, the drill just sinks. What do you think happened? Hit dirt. He hit dirt after four inches of concrete, not 14. Now, let's roll back to 1964. Why do you think we only have four inches of concrete instead of 14? You think it's because people are all good at heart? No, people are scumbags. They shorted us back in 64 when they built the building, right? Now, the problem is I've got the machine there, I've got everything, so what have I got to do? I've got to call in a guy with a concrete saw, and he's going to saw out a piece bigger than the machine, and then we're going to get in someone with a jackhammer and jackhammer that stuff up. We're going to scoop all that crap out of there, and we're going to get one of those tiny little backhoes to come in and dig out the hole. Then we've got to put in the reinforcing wire and the rebar. Then we've got to pour concrete. But that's back before they had those big long swing things for pumping concrete over houses to make swimming pools. So we had like a freaking bucket brigade to fill in this hole. Now, when the whole thing's done, they put the finish on it, everything looks great. And we're basically back to where we started. Only that operation cost $40,000. What's the NPV of my project now? Negative 15,000. And that was the last time that I made the mistake of having a project without a contingency fund. Contingencies, you're gonna see the, the big construction projects like this building here, they did a contingency of like 3% and it still wasn't enough. So they ended up having to cut out some things. So you guys may notice that there aren't as many toilets as there should be. Well, hey, we're gonna have to save a little money here because we're over budget, right? So what I'm telling you is, number one, when you see a positive NPV project and it's only slightly positive NPV and the investment's huge, be very careful because just the slightest miscalculation could turn this thing negative. And the second thing is that whenever you do put together a project, you always want to put contingencies in. I used 10%. And even when I did 10%, after that, my project started coming in under budget, but only barely, which tells me that they would have been over budget, all of them, if I hadn't. By the way, how often do you think uh, money surprises are pleasant surprises? Not very often. Once in a while, an uncle you never know, knew, or someone, an uncle, let's make it even better, an uncle that you hated dies and leaves you a bunch of money. That's a pleasant surprise, right? Two, two ways. You don't have to deal with the uncle anymore, plus he left you a bunch of cash. How often does that happen? Whoop, seldom, if ever. How often do you find yourself going, oh, man, and you have to spend more money than you plan to? Every day. Every day. So that's why the contingency has to be there. Okay, questions? This is kind of a stupid question, but with those like super expensive projects, why didn't you just like drill the concrete before? You know, uh, because I was 25 years old and didn't know any better. You're in a good position at 25 though. I was. I was managing a $12 million business at 25, and, and looking back on it, I think, holy crap, they should have never put me in charge. <laughs> Okay, back to the story. Mm -hmm. 
So what do we need for NPV? Well, first of all, we need the initial investment amount. We need the future cash flows and their timings. Now, cash flows two and three so may still be negative. We may still be building that factory. Um, the timing's important because we know about time value of money. And we also need a discount rate appropriate to the risk of the future cash flows. By the way, that's the rate that Chapter 12 was all about trying to find, was what is that rate that's appropriate to the risk of those future cash flows. So those are our three ingredients. By the way, the easiest one up there to get, which is it? Yeah, the initial investment, because you could hopefully get a quote that you can hold people to. I had a quote that I could hold people to, but it still wasn't perfect on initial investment because of the mistake or the, the thing that we didn't know about, right? And then the next one might be the future cash flows and their timing. It's kind of a toss up because future cash flows and the timing and the discount rate, in the end, they're just swags, right? They're swags and they require um, a lot of work and a lot of judgment. Okay, so uh, th this is actually so pathetic. I'm just going to skip it for you guys because you guys know. Okay, so let's run the NPV rule over our three questions. Number one, does it account for the time value of money? Yeah, how? Net present value. Yeah, it's net present value, right? We're looking at the present value of those future cash flows. Number two, does it account for the riskiness of the cash flows? No. You say no? Okay. Any other? <laughs> You know what the other answer could be, right? Nope. Yeah, because of the discount rate. Yeah! Remember that chapter 12 was all about finding the, the rate of return that's required based on the risk? Well, that's what we're doing with that discount uh, rate, and so that's accounting for the riskiness of the cash flows. And finally, does it provide information regarding the wealth created by the project? Yeah, dollars and cents. Now, once again, it's a swag. But it gives you an idea of magnitude, right? Is it going to be a million? Is it going to be 10 million, 50 million? That sort of thing. Okay, so how many stars would we give in PV? Yeah, it's going to get three stars, and there's only three possible. Therefore, NPV is our gold standard. So NPV is going to be the rule that we judge every other rule by. And we like to say that NPV works every time, but I want to put a caution out there. All of these things are only as good as the information you feed into them. And so if you put garbage in one end, what are you getting out the other? Yeah, garbage. And so the more work and effort you put into making sure your numbers are right, the better your answer is going to be coming out of NPV. So now let's go from perhaps the most complex one to the easiest one, the payback period. And that's simply the amount of time it takes to break even. What do we mean by break even? For the cash flows that are coming back in to add up to equal the initial investment. That's all we're talking about with payback. And we're going to calculate it by adding back those future cash flows to the original until we hit zero. Now, our rule here is to accept all projects that pay back on or before the arbitrary cutoff. What's arbitrary mean? Um, is that? No. You're thinking about arbitrage, an arbitrage free condition. Go ahead. It's not like a calculated number. Yeah, it's not like a calculated number. In fact, uh, so sometimes people will refer to this as anal extrapolation. You just pull a number out of your butt, right? It's not quite that bad, uh, but it is just basically coming up with a number. Now, the number uh, usually is come up with by someone who has experience and who's been through things before and has a pretty good idea of what we should be looking for. Uh, in my case, in uh, 1994, that man was a, a guy named Ed Phipps. If you've ever had an MRE, magnetic MRI, magnetic resonance imaging, if you've ever had that, you can thank Ed Phipps. He was the one that commercialized that technology for General Electric. By the time I get to know him, he is vice president of manufacturing at Halliburton. And he'd been around for over 20 years doing stuff like this. So when he said, 
we needed to have a payback of two years, uh, there was a reason behind it. And we'll talk about kind of what led to him coming up with that two-year payback. Now, keep in mind it's on or before. So if the arbitrary cutoff is two years and we have a project that comes in at exactly two years, then we accept it. So what do we need for payback? Well, we need the initial investment amount and the future cash flows and their timing. Does that sound familiar so far? Those two were definitely needed for NPV, but we don't need the discount rate, which is one of the reasons that NPV, or that, sorry, payback is easier than NPV. Um, and instead, we're gonna put in this arbitrary cutoff in years. So here is our first payback example. What is the payback of the following cash flows? And our arbitrary cutoff here is two years. And basically what you would be given in a problem or on an exam would be the first two columns only. The first two columns only. Times zero, one, two, and three, and we know what the cash flows are then. And then I want you to set up another column over to the right. And we're gonna treat this thing like a negative checkbook. Why do I say a negative checkbook? In a checkbook, you put a bunch of money in and then you write out a bunch of small checks. Well, in this case, we're taking a bunch of money out and then we're paying in a bunch of small payments. So it's the exact opposite of a checkbook. But the idea of the balance is exactly the same. Okay, so what does that mean? At time zero, we've got a cash flow of minus $50,000. That's our initial investment. And so our balance at that time is gonna be negative $50,000. And then at time one, we're going to receive positive $30,000. If I take a negative $50,000 and add positive $30,000, what am I left with? Negative $20,000. Very good. And so that's going to be the balance at the end of year one. And then in year two, we've got a positive $20,000 cash flow. What's a positive $20,000 cash flow plus a negative $20,000 balance? What do we get? Zero. Have we broken even? Yeah. What is the payback period for this project? Two years. Two years. Would we accept it or reject it? Yeah, we would accept it. If only all payback questions were this easy, your life would just be so beautiful. But unfortunately, sometimes it's not so pretty. And so basically what we have here are the same set of cash flows, only instead of the initial cash flow being 50,000 out, we've got 40,000 out. And I'm gonna tell you, just to give you a, some framework for a business situation, uh, engineers, we love new machines, and so what we would do is we would figure out what machine we wanted, and we would go to the dealer and we'd say, how much for this machine? And, and the dealer would say, $70,000 or $100,000. And we're saying, okay, right? And we're, we're totally, we don't care about money, right? We're, we're interested in this new machine. My boss's boss figured out what we were doing. And he said, hey, fellas, we have this group here. Uh, they're called procurement. Do you know what procurement does? If I call them purchasing, does that help out? Yeah, they're basically, they are negotiating with our suppliers. And the reason we didn't think to talk about them, talk to them is because they're usually buying raw materials, things like that. And so we didn't even think to talk to these people. But he said, oh yeah, you need to, and the woman's name was Ramey Dingle. I'll never forget her name, Ramey Dingle. He says, you guys need to talk to Ramey Dingle. And I'm like, what do you think Ramey can get out of this guy that we can't? And he says, are you kidding me? Ramey is a badass. And so we, uh, we turn over our dealer, we invite him in, turn him over to Ramey. And about two hours later, he walks out of the conference room. He's looking all drained and whatnot. And his prices come down by 10,000 bucks. Now, was that worth two hours worth of effort? Absolutely it was. That $10,000 that we didn't have to pay on that up front, that's shareholder money, right? So the NPV of this project is now gonna be 10,000 higher. Does that make sense? Okay, so sometimes uh, you get your procurement people involved and that initial cash flow isn't quite as much. We should be thrilled, except for one thing. Now it makes the math a little harder. $40,000 $40, out the door. Year one, we've got 30,000 that comes in, 30,000 plus 
negative 48,000 gives me negative 10,000. Have we broken even yet? No. The next year we get a $20,000 positive cash flow and now we are positive 10,000. Have we broken even? Yeah. And we know that our payback period is less than the arbitrary cutoff. Therefore, we know we're going to accept the project. But do you think that will be good enough for an exam or a homework? No, we're going to make you calculate the decimal 1.7 years, 1.2 years. And how do you go about doing that? Well, first of all, start with the year number, the year number that has the last negative balance. Which one is that up here? One. We're going to say one and then we're going to say plus. Now the next question, or the next thing we need to do is take the amount of money we still owe and make sure you put it in as a positive. We're going to take the amount of money we still owe and divide it by the cash flow from the period after the last negative balance. The period after the last negative balance here is two. We're going to take $20,000 there as our denominator, the numerator. We've got $10,000 left that we owe on this thing. And so we're going to take $10,000, divide by $20,000, and get 0 0.5. What does that mean? It means we expect that six months into that year, we're going to have this thing broken even, right? Broken, 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 broken. We're going to have it even, right? Okay, so that's why we're going to take that last year of negative balance, 1, plus the 0.5, and that's going to tell us that this thing pays back in 1.5 years. Now, there's an assumption there. The assumption is that cash flows within these years are uniform, meaning they're the same every day of the year. And I don't believe that's a good, a good idea looking at these cash flows. These cash flows appear to be higher in earlier times and lower in later times. And so my guess is in year two that you're going to actually, we'll probably break even a little sooner than 1.5 years because more of that cash flow is going to happen in the first part of the year, less of it in the second part of the year. But we don't have enough information to make that kind of call, so we stick with the assumption that cash flows are uniform within the year. Any questions? Okay, so let's ask the questions. Does payback account for the time value of money? No. no. Does it account for the riskiness of the cash flows? How did we account for the riskiness of the cash flows with NPV? Through the discount rate, right? Where's your discount rate now? It's not there. So that's an O2. And does it provide information regarding the wealth created by the project? No, man. I could put a discount rate on this thing that's high enough that this would be a negative NPV project. I could put a discount rate on this thing that was low enough that it would be a positive NPV project. Uh, we just can't tell from the payback rule. So how many stars? Zero. You say, wait a minute, zero stars. This thing's a dog with fleas. But wait, there's more. Uh, we, we've already said it doesn't consider the time value of money. Let me demonstrate that to you with projects A and B up here. A and B have identically the same payback period of three years. They both pay back in three years. Uh, they just got a different uh, cash flows at different times. Which one would you prefer, A or B? Knowing what you know about net present value, which one would you prefer? Yeah, I prefer B. Why? You get more money sooner. Now, you're going to get the same number of dollars, but you're getting the money sooner. I would always like more money sooner, right? Because the time value of money. So, we know already that payback has this flaw of not considering the time value of money, but it's got even another one that we haven't yet considered. And that is that it doesn't consider the cash flows after payback. So look at B and C. The cash flows up to break even are exactly the same. And so under the payback rule, we should be equally pleased to take either one of those. But which one of them would you like? C. Yeah, why? C year four cash flow. Oh my goodness, look at that year four cash flow. Now, Let's, uh, let's be honest about cash flows like that. Do they really occur in the real world? No. 
But I'll tell you what I have seen. I've seen projects that we knew were going to be dead after four years. And then I had another project where that 60 just went on forever, basically. Which one of those would you prefer? Yeah, 64, the money goes on forever. Payback doesn't take that into account. And so there's yet another problem with payback. You're saying, wow, this thing is a total piece of crap. So why, why, why would we still use it? Well, the answer, so it's simple. Um, so I'm working in a machine shop, Duncan, Oklahoma, and we are making pumps. And these pumps use these brass rings. And the way you make the brass rings is by using a lathe to carve the inside diameter and the outside diameter of a tube to the correct dimensions for the ring. And then you chop those rings off. And there's a guy that stands there with a hook and catches these rings as they come off. And then he tosses them in this big box. And then he has to go find the forklift and he has to take that to the workstation of a guy named Ralph. By the way, the guy with the hook was Ronnie. Uh, Ralph is doing what we call deburring. Whenever you cut your fingernails, you feel that sharp feeling afterwards. When you do that with metal, it's like 25 times worse. And so anytime you cut metal, you end up with sharp edging, edges. And so that's why you end up with uh, what's called a deburring operation right after, is to get rid of those burrs. And we had this guy named Ralph, and Ralph would sit on this chair in the shop all day long, and he had a pneumatic tool with a spinning shaft, and it had some floppy sandpaper on the end, and he would go <laughs> all day long, <laughs> one ring at a time, all day long. The guy that ran the machine, Ronnie, came up to me one day, and he said, I've got an idea. I said, great, what's your idea? And he said, instead of having Ralph over there doing that, why don't you just give me one of those big vibrating tumbler things with the, the media in it, with the ceramic cones, and we'll put some abrasive soap in there, and it'll knock those edges off, and you can fire Ralph. Now, something I haven't told you yet, Ralph made a pass at Ronnie's wife at the company picnic, um, Ronnie knows his wife is a smart woman. She's not going to leave him for a man with no job. So what does he want to happen to Ralph? Unemployment, right? Okay. So I'm like, keep, I'm listening, keep talking. And he says, oh, you know, he tells me basically what we would need to do. And I'm like, okay, great. I'll be right back. And back then we didn't have the internet like you have it today. In fact, the World Wide Web was just brand new. That's what WWW stands for, by the way. And so I went and got the, what, what was our equivalent of the internet, the McMaster car catalog, big yellow catalog, at least eight inches thick. And we went through the McMaster car catalog and we found every single thing that we needed to make Ronnie's dream come true. And back then in 1994 dollars, it was about 1,500 bucks. And so our time zero cash flow was minus 1,500. Time one, how much are we saving if we fire Ralph? 40,000, 40,000, 40,000. You see how this works? And, and we'll, we'll, we'll say 39,500. We'll assume that we've got to spend about $500 a year to keep this thing running, right? Now, do you think, uh, so first of all, Ronnie was a very bright man. He could do trigonometry. Machinists can do that. But do you think he knew how to use a TIBA2 plus? No. Do you think this project was actually big enough to worry about doing full NPV analysis? Now, if you look at how much money I was making as an engineer uh, versus how much time I would have had to have taken to come up with this, I might have burnt more than $1,500 worth of company resources just on putting the project together. Whereas Ronnie and I can fill out the simple little payback form in about 15 minutes and be good to go. Do you think we might have reached the same conclusion using NPV. Oh yeah, the discount rate on that would have had to have been hellaciously high in order for that thing to have been a negative NPV project. So, so far it's looking like that for these small, simple projects, this is a perfectly fine way to go. It's also good for firms with scarce capital and lots of growth opportunities. What does scarce mean? Okay, someone giving the opposite of scarce. Abundant. 
Abundance. Abundance. Very good. So scarce means we don't have a lot of it. And in fact, the definition of scarcity here is we don't have enough capital to invest in all positive NPV projects, right? That's, that's capital scarcity. Now, the slide here says lots of growth opportunities. Uh, the, the situation I found myself in, we didn't have a lot of growth opportunities, but we had a lot of opportunities for cost savings because the company had been so poorly run for so long of a time. Now, even though we were in the American capital markets, the best capital markets in the world, we still had scarce capital because once again, the company had been run poorly for a long time. As a result, no one wanted to buy our stock, no one wanted to buy our bonds. And so what did we have to work with? We just had the addition to retained earnings, our internal equity. This is why Ed, in his wisdom, said two years, guys, two years. We're going to do projects with paybacks of two years. Now, why is that a good thing? Because you get the money back quickly, and then what can you do with it? Reinvest it. Yeah, you reinvest because, after all, you've got lots of opportunities, right? We're, we're not short on ideas here. We're short on cash, and we'd rather get that money back pretty quickly. And in fact, where do you start out on these things? Are you guys familiar with the concept of low-hanging fruit? Mr. Crawford, what is low-hanging fruit? It's the Yeah, so you go home to visit your grandfather, and he says, hey, go out in the orchard and get me an apple. Do you go out there and you look for the very highest apple and you're like, well, dang, I'm going to have to get a ladder for that. And you go out and get a ladder and you climb up there and then you get to it and it's got a, it's got a worm. So then you have to move the ladder and get to another. No! You're going to go around and you're going to find the one that's closest, lowest, that doesn't have a worm in it. And you're going to pick that and you're going to take it to your grandpa. Now, assuming uh, grandpa likes the apple and wants another one, now you come back and grab the next lowest hanging fruit. Do you think that there are things that we can easily do that can have a big impact? Absolutely. I'll give you an example. We were spending millions of dollars a year disposing of machine coolant. Machine coolant is a 5% emulsified oil, so it's got some sort of soap in it to keep it where it would go into the water, and 95% water. And we're spending 60 cents a gallon to dispose of this crap that is 95% water. What's the simple solution? boil the water out. Then you're only paying to dispose of 5% of that volume. So we were able to cut our disposal cost by almost 95%, right? It costs us two to 3,000 bucks to set up this boiler. And then, of course, we had steam that was coming in, but it was steam that had already cycled through the factory. It was kind of waste steam anyway. And so basically, that was a huge low-hanging fruit kind of cost savings opportunities. And when you've got stuff like that laying around, it absolutely makes sense to have a payback of two years. Because it's crazy at that point to go out and invest in something that's going to take a long time to pay back because you want to get that money back so you can reinvest it. Questions? Okay, now uh, provides quicker feedback on managerial decision making. I want you to look at this set of payments down on the bottom. Well, this is what we call as a hockey stick forecast. Can you see the hockey stick in there? Where it goes along relatively shallow and then it's like Burp! off at it. Now, why would anyone make predictions like that? Do you think projects actually typically pay like that in the real world? No, I would expect it to look something like this, right? Why do you think people are putting that, those, those big cash flows out farther in time? Well, it turns out that if you estimate a big enough cash flow out in the future, you can make NPV positive and you can get your project accepted. Do you think people want their projects accepted? Absolutely they do. Uh, do you think they're willing to lie to get their projects accepted? Absolutely they are because people are scumbags. Now you may say, wait a minute, this is going to catch up to them eventually, right? But I'm going to tell you two things. Number one, not every company follows up and audits these things to see if they're paying off as they're supposed to. And uh, the average amount of time that an American manager spends in a job is 
about three years. Can you see the scumbaggery? Okay, now, I actually work with a guy named Dan. And he was, he was doing this. I'm like, Dan, that's total crap and you know it. He said, yeah. I said, what are you doing? He says, go get my project accepted. And I said, they're going to bust you. And he says, no. He says, first of all, these schmucks don't even bother to look. And the second thing is that uh, I'm going to be promoted into a different uh, management position somewhere else by that time anyway. I'm like, okay, whatever. Within six months, they had started auditing the projects. I loved it because Dan would walk in every day kind of shaking after that happened because he knew he'd been doing this crap for years, right? And now people are going to check up on him. Questions? Did Dan get fired? No, surprisingly, Dan is still with that company, which tells me I'm glad I'm not with that company, right? This is terrible, and I'm going to tell you a horrible, horrible truth here. What percentage of people do you think get fired every year? I mean, at, at a, in a typical company. If it's 10%, I would be surprised that it's that high. So what does that really mean about what level of performance you have to put in in order not to get fired? Isn't that sad? Now, don't be that guy, but that's why he's still there. Now let's talk about discounted payback. Remember, we said that there were two problems, or two of the three problems, actually there were many problems with uh, payback. We said one of the problems was it didn't account for time value of money. Another is that it doesn't account for risk. And so people were like, well, hey, wait a minute. We could solve this problem just by including the discount rate. Instead of doing this, these years just in nominal amounts, we'll find the present value of year one, and that's what we use for year one. We'll find the present value of year two. That's what we'll use for year two, and so forth. And, you know, that just sounds really, really great. But I'm going to tell you, number one, it doesn't solve the problem of cash flows after payback. And so it doesn't give us information about the wealth created by the project. So that's the first problem with this thing. And the second is you have to have the same darn ingredients to calculate NPV plus an arbitrary cutoff. If I've got the ingredients to calculate NPV, perhaps what should I be doing instead? Calculate NPV. So we've got perfectly good ingredients and we're using them to make crap. And this is where I'm going to tell you that it's just exactly what my mom used to do. She would take crackers, eggs, ketchup, and ground beef. And I'm very fond of all four of those things. And she would combine them into this monstrosity called meatloaf. Now, I know there are at least two weirdos in here that really love meatloaf, and God bless you for it. But, oh my goodness, maybe your mom's was better than mine. But this thing is meatloaf. It's absolute meatloaf. So, am I going to require you to know how to do it? No. Am I going to require you to do it on exams or anything? No. Now, what I am going to require is that when your boss asks you to do this crap, that you be able to give the meatloaf speech so your boss will know exactly <laughs> what a piece of crap this is. Now we're on to average accounting return. And if there's anything that accountants love more than numbers, it's words. Here we go. Average accounting return is the average project earnings after taxes and depreciation divided by the average book value of the investment over its life. And finance people say to accountants, hey, couldn't we just call that average net income over average book value? And the answer is yes. All right, we can. It's, it's just a whole lot easier to think of it that way. So what do we need? We need projected accounting earnings. By the way, are those cash flows? Do our accounting earnings cash flows? No, they've got all sorts of stuff in them like depreciation, deferred taxes, accounts payable, accounts receivable, blah, blah, blah. It, you, there's just all sorts of crap in there. So I want you to know right off, we're not talking about cash flows here. Secondly, we need an investment amount and a depreciation schedule. Remember, we're looking at average book value. In order to figure out the book value, we have to have historical cost minus accumulated depreciation, which is 
uh, decided by that depreciation schedule. And then we need a minimum acceptable AAR, which is another arbitrary cutoff. But this time, instead of being the vice president of manufacturing, uh, it would come out of the accounting department, probably from the controller or someone like that would come up with this arbitrary cutoff. And what's our rule? We want to accept all projects with AAR greater than or equal to the minimum AAR. So let's work an example here. In fact, they've been so kind as to already figure out the net income for each of the five years of the project. There's one piece of information that you need up here that you could figure out if you, if you worked through it, uh, but I'm just going to tell you straight up. The initial investment here is $500,000. And I have two pieces of evidence that the initial investment is $500,000. First of all, when they get down here to figuring the average investment times zero cash flow is $500,000. The second thing that I'm going to show you is that the depreciation for each year, one through five, is $100,000. That is consistent with a straight line depreciation to zero over the life of the project. So that's where we come up with our, we know it's, we know it's 500,000. Okay, so we had net income for years one, two, three, four, and five. And basically, we are just gonna add all those together and divide by five. Why are we dividing by five? Yeah, was, we're just figuring an average, right? Okay, now let's talk about how we come up with the book value here. Remember the book value, <laughs> at time t is equal to the historical cost minus the depreciation at time t. You could also say that it's equal to the book value at t minus 1 subtract depreciation at time t, which is actually my favorite way to do it because then you don't have to have a, a line that's accumulated depreciation, which I hate to do because I'm lazy. Anyway, uh, but as far as spreadsheet goes, that second one's far better. So let's take a look at this. In the beginning, the book value, what's the historical cost is 500,000. How much depreciation is there at time zero? zero. Yeah, there's zero. And so the book value at time zero is going to be $500,000. How much depreciation at time one? Yeah, 100,000. And so we're looking at the book value at time one is equal to the book value at time zero, 500,000, minus 100,000 in depreciation. Now, so that's what, 400,000. So now we're on to time two. And we are looking at a book value uh, at time one of 400,000 minus depreciation at time two of 100,000. And that brings us down to 300,000. And we keep doing that on out until we get to the end. And finally, at the end of year five, we get to a book value of zero. By the way, that's what straight line to zero means, that at the end, your book value is going to be zero. Okay, now I'm going to take all those book values, I'm going to add them together, and I'm going to divide by six. Why six, not five? Yeah, we've got time zero here. So we actually have six values of this thing, not five. We've got six values, not five. And so we're going to add all those together. We're going to divide by six, and we come up with $250,000. Now, I'm going to teach you a slight trick here. If you are depreciating straight line to zero over the life of the project, the average book value will be exactly one half the initial investment. Let me say that again. If we are straight line depreciating to zero over the life of the project, then the average book value will be exactly one half of the initial investment. And so some of you will see uh, explanations on problems and they're like, why are they just taking the initial investment dividing by two? And at that moment I want you to think, aha, it's because if your straight line depreciating to zero over the life of the project, then the average book value is exactly one half the initial investment. Have I said that enough that you know it now? Yes. Very good. Thank you. I appreciate that. Okay, now, we have our average net income of 50000 We have our average 
uh, investment of 250,000, uh, we're going to take 50 divided by 250 and it comes up with 20%. If our arbitrary cutoff AAR is 15, do we accept or reject? What's the rule? X. Yeah, if this number is larger than the arbitrary cutoff, then we accept it. Is 20 larger than 15? Yeah, so we should accept. What if our arbitrary cutoff is 25? We reject it, right? Now, what if the arbitrary cutoff was 20? Yeah, we accept it because it's at or above, right? Okay. So that's how we calculate this. Now, I want to show you one more thing over here. Look at year five. Look at the taxes. Taxes there are negative. How many of you have ever had a situation where you had negative taxes and the government just wrote you a check? It, it doesn't really happen. Now, you're, you're thinking of a refund, right, where you pay too much in. Government's always glad for you to pay too much in, right? So you say, wait a minute, this is stupid. We can't have a negative cash flow here. You can't, and here's why. We assume that all these projects that we are looking at are on top of an otherwise profitable firm. An otherwise profitable firm has taxes, uh, positive taxes elsewhere, that the 16,667 negative can offset. And so as long as we have $16,667 worth of taxes somewhere else in the firm that we have to pay, then we're still good to go. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, if I were a startup and this were my only project, should I have a negative tax number there? No. I would just go with zero in that case. If this was your only project, I would go with zero. Okay. Let's see what else we've got here. Let's do our three questions. Number one, does it account for the time value of money? No way, man. Did you see that they just took all those numbers and threw them into the same hopper and divided by five or six? They're not discriminating between cash flows that happen at time one versus cash flows that happen at time five. It's just all in one big bucket. So that's a zero, that's a no. Does it account for the riskiness of the cash flows? Absolutely not. Now, occasionally I'll have an accountant to say, oh, wait a minute, we have a higher arbitrary cutoff for riskier projects. And I say, that's fine. Tell me, dear sir or madam, how did you get that number? What scientific uh, techniques did you use to arrive at that? And then they, they're like, uh, uh, uh. It's not scientific. It's not like when we go out to find the discount rate using the capital asset pricing model and, and that sort of stuff. It's not. And so uh, we, can, we can still say definitely it does not account for the riskiness of the cash flows. And finally, does it provide information regarding the wealth created by the project? Any ideas? Absolutely not. In fact, remember if I told you, I remember I told you early that it doesn't even use real cash flows, right? If we're using funny money numbers, how are we going to come up with information regarding whether or not this thing is creating or destroying wealth? We just don't know. So, how many stars do we get this one? Zero. Zero. So, we know it's a piece of crap. The numbers, uh, why, why do we use this thing? Well, first of all, we say the numbers are readily available. Now, I know there aren't just accounting numbers laying out there that you could just pick up off the ground, but let me tell you about my own personal experience. My accountant's name was Jack. And uh, Jack was the only guy in the business unit that had his, his, he had a single office with no windows. And so basically he was starved for A, human contact, and B, sunshine, right? And so here's how you'd make Jack's day. You'd go by and you'd say, Jack, and he would grunt. And then you'd say, I need some numbers. And he would go, <laughs> because accountants love to create numbers. It's like what they live for. So he, he's like firing up the spreadsheet. He's like, what do you need? Jack would very easily be thrilled to produce this kind of, these kinds of numbers for me. So it's really easy. And I'm lazy, right? I'm lazy. I'd get Jack to do that. The second one is maybe a little more of a good reason to do it, and that's that it's easy to calculate. 
Did we need the TIBA2 plus? No. Now, so far though, those first two are just really kind of crap reasons. Now maybe let's talk about something that has a little bit of the smell of rationality about it. And that is that stockholders and media pay attention to these return on equity and return on asset kinds of ratios. And so you'll actually have people talk about ROE and ROA on uh, CNBC. And it turns out that average accounting return kind of looks like ROA. Because remember, ROA is net income over total assets. This is basically like ROA for the project. Because we got the net income on the top and we got the book value on the bottom. And so it really is kind of uh, like ROA. And so you might say, well, wait a minute. This is actually a pretty good idea because all I have to do is accept projects with a uh, AAR greater than my ROA and I could grow the ROA of the firm. That's a fine, fine argument except for one thing. It does not consider the risk. It does not consider the risk. I can take on high ROA projects all day long, but they could be really risky. For example, smuggling in migrants underneath the border. Do you think that's profitable? Do you think there's a high ROA? Yeah, under these ideas of, oh, hey, it was just accept anything higher than AAR, we would accept that project. Now, even leaving the illegality of it aside, it makes the company riskier. And by the way, those could be negative NPV projects. So, it's, uh, that, that argument falls flat after a bit too. And then my favorite reason that people still use AAR is sometimes your boss is an accountant. Sometimes your boss is an accountant. So this is a, in the later 1990s, our old CEO who had come up through operations and basically knew the business was retiring and they decided to hire a new CEO from the office of Arthur Anderson in Houston, Texas. And for any of you who are history buffs, that's the same office that was doing Enron's books, right? And so we hired this guy, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with this guy, I'm sure he's a fine, fine person, but I had never saw anybody talk about average accounting return until that guy became the CEO. We talked about NPP, we talked about IR, we talked about payback. That was it. Okay, now, here's what happens. Let's assume your boss is an accountant. Your boss comes to you and says, uh, I want you to check out this project, and if it's got a higher average accounting return, then, or if you know, your cutoff is 20%. And you say, yes, boss. And you move off and you do your analysis. And it comes out positive. What should you do? You should also do NPV. And if the NPV reaches the same decision as AAR, which do you report to the boss? Yeah, the AAR, because that's what they ask you to do, right? Now, what if they're not the same? What if AAR says accept, NPV says reject, and your boss says, I don't care about NPV, we accept. Here's what you do. Now, and keep in mind, the year is, at this point, 1997. I go back to my desk. Uh, there's a computer on my desk, but we haven't quite figured out how to use those yet. So I reach into my, my lower drawer, and I have a log book. And I write down. August 29th, 1997. Bob asked me to do an AAR analysis for this machine and I, and I lay everything out there. I told Bob this thing destroyed shareholder wealth and we should under no way do it and he said, and then you go ahead and use whatever profanity Bob used, right? And you just write it down and you put that in your drawer. Now, why do you do that? Because about a year or two from now when the investigation happens, they're gonna come to you and they're like, oh, hey Crawford, I saw your name on this paperwork. How could you be so dumb? Don't you know about NPV? And you say, wait. You open the desk drawer, you get it out, you read the passage to them. And then you say, would you like a copy of that? You go make a copy and you hand it to them. What do you think happens next? Yeah, maybe, uh, maybe Bob gets a boop and you get his job, right? Just throwing it out there. By the way, trying to get rid of your boss is kind of like popping a zit. Make sure you do it the first time, or it's just going to make things worse, right? Isn't that terrible? People are scumbags. Questions?
Now let's talk about the internal rate of return. And this is a definition that you very, very much need to have on your note sheet and to remember. And that is that IRR is merely the discount rate that makes NPV equal to zero. IRR is just the discount rate that makes NPV equal to zero. We're going to use that definition here in an example and uh, we're going to use it in other places too. So what is the rule? Well, we're going to accept all projects with IRR greater than the appropriate discount rate. Guess what folks, that is identically the same appropriate discount rate that we're using for NPV. It's the same discount rate we found in chapter 12. It is the discount rate that's appropriate to the risk of those cash flows. It's all the same. So what do we need for IRR? Well, we need an initial investment amount, we need future cash flows and their timing, and we need a discount rate appropriate to the risk of the future cash flows. Well, folks, those are exactly what we see we need for NPV. And when we get to the end of this chapter, one of the things we're going to do is talk about who actually uses what. And we're going to find out that if someone uses NPV, that they almost 100% of the time also use IRR. And the answer is quite simple why that is. If you have all the information available to do NPV, you can do IRR and it takes about 13 seconds. And we'll talk about why that might be valuable to have. Okay, so simple example. We've got a project that's going to pay 110 a year for, from today. The investment's $100 a day. What's the IRR? Well, we, get a, we don't know the discount rate. Um, we know that we can set up the NPV formula like this, negative initial investment plus present value of future cash flow, so there we go. Um, and now we're going to solve this thing for R. And when we do that, we can easily see that R would be 10%. Now you say, wait a minute, this IRR stuff is so, so easy. Um, how, why are we concerned about how difficult this is to calculate? It's not really that simple, and here's why. What if I had times zero, or I had NPV of zero equal to minus 100 plus 110 divided by 1 plus R uh, plus uh, 20 divided by 1 plus R squared plus 30 divided by 1 plus R to the third. Do I have any mathematical geniuses here? No one's willing to confess, not even you, Mr. Dixon. No, he's not. Okay, he's not going to confess. So, I'm not a mathematical genius by any stretch. I've had uh, 13 hours of calculus and I've had three hours of differential equations and I, had all, and I can tell you this. I still can't solve that for R. So, what do you do? You end up doing something called iteration. Iteration. Iteration is repeated guessing. Iteration is just repeated guessing. So here, here we go. We're going to make our first guess at R, and if that guess is too large, then the present values on that will be too small, and my NPV on where it says zero, that side's going to be negative. And that's going to tell me that I need to ratchet down on my estimate for R. Well, the next time I've ratcheted down too far, and it comes out to be positive. And so I, I keep I'm homing in on this number. And your ability to get the correct answer in a reasonable amount of time has mostly to do with your ability to make a good first guess. And in fact, in engineering school, we had to do this during exams, iteration. Do you think I'm going to make you do iteration during exams? No, that would be cruel. Besides. The folks at TI Texas Instruments have baked that straight into your TI BA2 Plus. That thing actually will guess for you. If you don't believe me later on when you're playing around with your calculators, like I know you always do when you're out, you know, having a good time with your friends at the bar, you get the calculator out. I want you to uh, use it to calculate NPV and I want you to watch how fast it comes up. It calculates that number directly. It just goes boop and it just pops up. But what about IRR? When you hit that button, you hit IRR and you hit compute, notice how long it actually takes for that number to pop up. That calculator is doing repeated guessing. Now it's better at it than you are, it's certainly faster at it than you are, 
But that's exactly what the calculator is doing because you can't solve that thing for R. Questions? Okay, so let's do an example here. <clears throat> an investment of $200 a day gets you $100 per year for the next three years. What is the IRR? When we start playing around with our calculators to do MQB and IRR, we are going to be dealing with the CF keys. CF, sick, clear work. You got to do that because there may be stuff in there beyond the amount of cash flows we're going to put in, and if you don't get rid of them, we're going to leave you with all sorts of misery. Okay, cash flow at time zero, we are going to invest $200 today. So I'm going to say 200, negative, enter, arrow down. Let's see, zero, one. Yeah, 100, and it's positive. Enter, arrow down. What is F01? Three. three. Why three? three? Yeah, that cash flow happens three years in a row, right? Now, how do I get IRR? Yeah, you just hit the IRR button, and then you got to hit compute. And it comes up to 23.375%. Now, the uh, discount rate is 20%. We accept or reject? We accept. The discount rate is 25%. We accept or reject? Reject. The discount rate is 23.375192857. Reject. Yeah, let's go back and look at the rule. There's no equal to. And in fact, if they were equal, that would mean that the NPV was equal to zero. Do we accept zero NPV projects? No. Okay. Now, does IRR account for the time value of money? Yeah, you remember all this present value crap that we were doing over here? That's time value of money. Does it account for the riskiness of the cash flows? Yeah, Mr. Sutherland, how do we account for the risk of the cash flows in IRR? Discount rate. Yeah, the discount rate. That's what we're, we're uh, splashing this thing against. And does it provide information regarding the wealth provided by the project? Just take a guess. Yes. Okay, so I've got a yes. Do I have any no's? Wait. Yes or no to that question. Okay, so does it provide information regarding the wealth created by the project? I have one yes. Are you a no? Why not? Why not? Very I'll good. Yeah, very good. Okay, well, in this fact, in this case, you would both be right. And here's why. It does provide uh, information on whether or not we are creating wealth. If IRR is greater than the discount rate, in most cases, NPV is greater than zero, we are creating wealth. If IRR is below the discount rate, in most cases, we are destroying wealth. But do we know how much? No. We don't know how much. We don't. And so I'm going to give this two and a half stars. It's not quite three stars. I'm going to give it two and a half stars. Now let's talk about some problems with IRR. Uh, independent versus mutually exclusive projects. So let's say that on the same day, you were accepted to Missouri State University and you received a marriage proposal from someone who was also accepted to Missouri State University. Let's take that complication out of it. Are these independent decisions? Does one have anything to do with the other? Shouldn't, right? Um, you could go to Missouri State and not get married. You could get married and not go to Missouri State, right? Those are independent, uh, independent ideas. Now, let's assume, though, that you got accepted to Missouri State University and Kansas State University on the same day to go to the same semester. Are those independent decisions? You could do them both? No, those are called mutually exclusive. Now, let's assume that you get two marriage proposals on the same day. Can you accept them both? Not in the United States as of today. We have to put a lot of conditions on that, right? 
Not in the United States as of today. So uh, those are also mutually exclusive projects. If you do one, you can't do the other. Does that make sense? And so where we see that um, IRR has problems is with mutually exclusive projects. And we're going to show you why that is. So we have a street corner lot in Los Angeles. And this is such a nice lot. You can look around and you can see like Hermes and all sorts of upscale, Cartier, all sorts of, it's really, you're just very fortunate you've got this street corner lot. And you've been looking at two projects. You've got it narrowed down to two projects. And it could either be a snow cone stand or a swanky nightclub. Do you guys know what swanky means? Cool. Cool. What else? Is it cool in a bohemian poverty kind of way? No, it's a bit sw it's, uh, swanky is yeah, like up, upscale. Um, should you do the snow cone stand or the nightclub? So uh, we've got these cash flows. And we see that our initial cash flow for time zero is going to be minus 100. We have to invest 100. But after that, we get cash flows of 50, 50, 50. For the nightclub, of course, you're going to have to invest more money. We start off with minus 1,000, and then we have cash flows of 450, 450, 450. And so we are going to work through this. By the way, mutually exclusive, you can't do both. If you put a snow cone stand there, you can't have the nightclub. If you put a nightclub there, you can't have the snow cone stand. So let's go ahead and get our calculators out. And we'll say clear CF second. Clear work. Let's do the snow cone stand first. What do you put in for time zero? 100. Negative. Enter. Arrow down. Let's see. Zero, 1. 50. Enter. Arrow down. Uh, what, what's that zero, 1? 3. Why 3? Yep, you did it three times. Now, IRR compute. Why don't you go ahead and write that number down? 23.375%. Write it in the little box, this is IRR. And then I want you to tell me, do you recognize that number? Yeah, it's the same number we had earlier, right? And this is starting to expose one of the issues with IRR. It does not account for the scale of the project. All it accounts for are the proportions of the initial investment to the cash flows that follow after that. So in our case, the first one is twice as big and negative as the three that follow it. That's it. And so we had negative 200, 100, 100, 100. Here we've got negative 100, 50, 50, 50. What if I had negative a million, 500,000, 500,000, 500,000? I can tell you exactly what the IRR would be. If I had negative 2 million, 1 million, 1 million, 1 million, I could tell you exactly what the IRR is gonna be. It's gonna be this. Does that make sense? Because it's just how they relate to each other. Okay, now while we have these numbers here, oh by the way, I haven't told you yet, the required return on snow cone stands and on nightclubs, both 10% because they're equally risky apparently. Okay, so what are we going to do here? Let's go ahead and calculate N P V. Well, we have these numbers in our calculator. 10, enter, arrow down, compute. I'm getting an N P V of $24.34. Is that what you're getting? Yeah, go ahead and write that down. Go ahead and write that down. Okay, now we're going to say CF second clear work. What do I put in for CF zero for project B? Yeah, negative 1,000. Got to hit enter. Arrow down. Uh, what about cash flow one? 450. Enter. Arrow down. What do I do with this? What do I do now? Three, very good. Okay, now I'm gonna go ahead and compute the IRR. I'm getting 16.649%. 16.649%, go ahead and write that down. Now if we were using IRR to make our decision, 16.649% versus 24.34, oh wait a minute, no, so it wasn't 20, it was 23.375%, uh, right? Which one would you choose? Which one do you think is better? Sounds better. Yeah, the first one sounds better. You gotta be careful though, because 
if we hit NPV and we put in our 10, enter, arrow down, and compute, I'm getting 119.08 for net present value. Which would you rather have, $119.08 or $24.34? Yeah, you'd rather have Project B. And if you have trouble understanding which one of these to choose, think of the goal of financial management. The goal of financial management is to maximize shareholder wealth. Which one of these is going to create a bigger increase in shareholder wealth? Got to be Project B. Now, the reason we have to choose between them is because they're mutually exclusive. We can't do both. But what if these projects were independent? What if we could do both? What should our decision be? Yeah, you do them both because the rule is, if it's an independent project, you accept all positive and DV projects. Questions? Okay, next time we will talk about another issue with IRR. Go ahead, do your homework, do your practice, write down problems that are giving you issues, and we'll talk about them hopefully next time.